already. Um, so let me just introduce the much cleverer folks on the panel with me. Um, so Jocelyn Prince is our connectivity director here at Woolley. Um, <coughs> Jamil Jude is, um, you were formerly producer in residence at Mixed Blood. What is your current title, Jamil? Still producer in residence. Producer in residence, year two. Um, Radek Noy was our producer in residence at Woolley last season and is now our producing consultant. Um, so, uh, so Ronnie and Jocelyn have been uh, quite involved in the connectivity programming here at Woolley, and uh, Jamil has been very involved in the uh, hi, uh, in the radical hospitality program at Mixed Blood. Um, so, I want to make sure to give these folks some time to just sort of um, you know break down the basics about what those programs are. Um, but mainly, you know, because we're all colleagues here. Um, I want to make this as actually useful as possible <laughs> to you all. Um, so I'd rather start by just, you know, doing a little bit of engagement with you all and asking what what's most valuable for you to talk about, to ask about, to learn right now. Because we there's a lot of friendly stealing that goes on between our two our two companies, I think. A lot of sharing, a lot of stealing. Um, and uh, in the last couple seasons, I think, um, Nick Blood and Wooly have both done a lot of, um, as we said the other day, throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, doing a lot of experimentation. And I think at this point, we're sort of in the measuring and analyzing phase, trying to figure out the impact of all of these experiments um, and actually trying to, trying to figure out how to crunch that data in an effective way, listen to the data, and then adjust our behavior to, um, to get closer to the outcomes that we're intending. Um, so for us right now, I think it's um, audience engagement and whatever your you know, fancy word for it is. Um, it's all about goal setting. It's all about being really specific about what it is that you're trying to accomplish with regard to your audience and your community. Um, so I guess the, the basic examples that I'd give of that goal setting for us are, um, you know, questions of um, how many, how many butts are in your seats, how many audience members are you actually uh, recruiting? Because I think, you know, every, just about every cultural organization right now is in that, that panicky moment of, um, you know, do our, is our attendance declining and what can we do about it? Um, so how many is one question, I think. How is another one. How are you engaging with your audience dramaturgically before, during, or after the show? That's a related but really different question, I think. Um, and then uh, the third question that we talk about a lot is who? Who's actually in your audience? Um, is that the audience that your artists are intending to create work for? Are those the most exciting potential people to respond mm -hmm. to the piece? Um, and that, I think, is really interesting to, to talk about from the point of view of, of a new play theater because, you know, I mean, it's one thing to be, um, to be producing a piece of work that people basically know what it is. It's, it's vaguely familiar to, um, to people who sort of consume culture routinely. Um, and it's something very different, I think, to be doing new, innovative, unfamiliar, strange work. Um, and so a big part of what we talk about, I know, is, um, you know, how to make, the language that I use is, how to make innovative work intentional, exhilarating, and valuable for your audience. So what can you do to empower your audience to make meaning of new, innovative, unfamiliar work um, and take ownership over it and value it and become an advocate for it? Does all that make sense so far? Yeah? Cool. Okay. So, um, so of those big questions, how many audience members do you have? Who's in your audience, and how are you engaging with them? Um, can we just do a show of hands? Like, how many people are interested in talking about just how many butts are in your seats? Butts, butts. <laughs> a few. And a as, as Pete Miller, board member, says, empty theater seats are evil. So it's okay <laughs> to say the most important thing is just to get your seats filled. Um, okay, so a few people. How many are interested in talking about? Who's in your audience? Cool. Okay. And then how many people are interested in talking about how you're engaging with them? Oh, wow. Interesting. Um, great. Okay. Well, I will do a little bit of adjusting as, um, as these folks talk. Um, initially, this is actually a great segue because um, I'd like to start out by asking Ronnie to talk a little bit about um, how we engage with our audience members on presented work. Because I think even for us, you know, new play insiders, um, I mean, I know for me, when I look at a piece of devised theater that's not text-based, I sometimes have a hard time sort of, 
knowing what signposts to look for when I experience the piece, making meaning of it, trying to determine what the goals of the artists are, um, and, and you know, becoming an advocate for it myself. So, um, so Ronnie worked very hard on um, a piece that we presented this past season called Areas with a Twist. Um, so Ronnie, can you talk a little bit about um, what that means for you? Yeah, sure. So, um, so as Miriam talked a little bit about, for most of my um, producing residents at Woolly Mammoth, I was very focused on Woolly's uh, presented work. So all the companies and individual artists that um, <coughs> come to Woolly that are not you know, necessarily text-based. So before Aries with a Twist came, um, we did a lot of talking about what you know Aries was and what it meant to talk about a work like that that isn't scripted. So just to give you a little background on the show, um, Aries was a partnership between um, Basil Twist, um, who is a uh, well-known puppetry artist. Uh, Aries with a Twist was actually part of a Basil Twist um, festival in D.C. at Four Theaters, uh, which was studio. Um, and uh, the other artist was Joey Arias, who is known in New York, uh, more in the downtown scene, um, for his work as a drag artist. But as a singer, and in his kind of depictions of Billie Holiday, he's actually toured around the world. Um, performed uh, at Carnegie Hall. Um, so their, their partnership was really this um, mix of, you know, cabaret and performance meeting puppetry. But in terms of its uh, structure, it was really a series of songs that kind of lightly reflected Joey's life, um, everything from Genesis to Billie Holiday. So contextualizing something like that for uh, our audience was something that we knew was going to be a challenge, even though the actual experience of the show was really exciting. It just was using a whole different set of tools. So actually, the way that connecti connectivity started for that show, I really think, was really among the staff. Because what we uh, had was a DVD of the production. Um, but it really wasn't a very high quality DVD. Because of course, you know, you're in the back of a downtown theater, you're taking a video of it. It's not going to you know, sparkle the way that the show live is. So even talking about it and getting excited about it amongst the staff required a little bit of a different approach. Um, because it wasn't so much a script to be passed around, but a DVD. Um, so some of the things that we did among the staff was to show a, um, a docu-fantasy that was made uh, with a filmmaker about Joey's history, about Basil's history. And that was kind of an interesting road in for us because we realized that the appreciation of the piece really deepened as soon as you knew what, uh, where, the, where these artists were coming from and that each one of them was bringing this whole depth of craft and depth of experience um, into this show. So once we all understood that, then it became, okay, what are the most important things we need to let the audience know before they come in? There was a marketing question of what do they need to know to make them understand that this is what this show is and get them excited about it. Um, and then just giving them tools to be able to talk about it. So we tried to put uh, some of those tools in different places for different um, purposes. So uh, in the program note, the, the focus of that was really uh, to give the audience a sense of where these artists were coming from in terms of their uh, um, history. So a little bit of background of who they had worked with. Um, but then in the lobby experience, the approach we took there was really try to get the uh, audience awake to the fact that this was going to be a kind of a glamorous yet raunchy yet sit forward in your seat rather than back in your seat kind of experience. Because for the, for the first couple of previews, it was very interesting to see how the audience um, wasn't sure what to do. I mean, you know, you kind of want to like it, but it's, you're not kind of sure how to engage with it. So um, we'd initially started with a like red carpet from the, um, you know, glass doors all the way to the box office to kind of say, you know, welcome, this is going to be a different kind of experience. But then uh, as we went on, we started to add um, some kind of sexy table tents that kind of uh, hit on you, you know, as you were sitting there, um, that said, you know, funny things. Um, oh, I'm, of course, I'm like not coming up with any at the moment, which is probably fine because it's videotapes. But <laughs> um, so that was really fun, like excerpts from the show that were kind of coy things that Joey would kind of tease the audience with to kind of let people know that that was going to be part of the experience. Um, and then we, you know, added on to that even further with these um, kind of dry erase boards that were um, kind of like the characters you would see in bathroom signs, but without this area, the people could kind of draw whatever they wanted to to kind of understand that that was a major part of the experience. So we kept kind of ramping up a little bit more and more in the lobby experience to let people know, you know, this you need to kind of shake yourself up a little bit for what you're about to engage with. So that was. Um, those were some of the tools in terms of the lobby. Um, and then in addition to that, we tried to add uh, events, both uh, 
after the show in different ways to kind of highlight the different things in the show that we uh, really wanted our audience to be able to take away from it. So we had um, two events with the puppeteers that were them talking about their experience of working on the show. Uh, we had them uh, demonstrate how to use some of the puppets. Um, but uh, one of the events that I was really excited that we actually managed to uh, pull off was something called the Glamazon pageant. Um, and that involved working with uh, DC's um, burlesque and vaudeville community uh, and to bring them in and kind of see the show and, and do something after the show. So we actually, in the lobby here, um, made our own kind of uh, makeshift runway and had um, the uh, BY gays, who are part of a group here called Brightest Young Things, um, that are kind of a young, fantastic uh, group here. We had some of them being the judges. We had Willie Company members uh, judging the pageant. And essentially, we had uh, some burlesque and vaudeville acts coming down this runway and kind of competing to be the top glamazon. And it was really fun because you had it kind of operating on a number of different levels. First, there was this audience who was coming out of the show realizing, oh, there's actually kind of a DC component to these New York artists who we have coming in from out of town to do this uh, work. So that was kind of exciting. Um, and then Basil and Joey actually came out and were watching the Glamazon pageant, and so after the pageant there was some interaction between the two of them that was really exciting, you know, from kind of our local to the, you know, New York community. Um, but I, I think the most exciting thing was kind of just seeing this audience kind of put together all the pieces of, oh, that was on stage there, but this is on stage and this is from the local community, and it was uh, a lot of fun, um, ended in kind of drinks and general chatting and things like that. Um, but I think it was kind of an example of how beyond kind of your talk back, there's a different way that you can kind of engage and respond to um, a work. So, so a lot of the things that I've been thinking about over the past year is how um, you contextualize something for the audience, not just in terms of content, but also in terms of aesthetic. Because, you know, something we've kind of realized the more we've been um, talking at Wooly is that you know, your audience member won't necessarily perceive the difference between presented and produced, but what they will perceive is a difference in what that experience is. Um, so really trying to give your audience tools for that, just to, to help them see that they're, what the value is that they should be pulling out. Um, because I, I know here at Worldly we have an incredible amount of smart audience members, but it's always, um, you know, if, if, if the engagement is civic discourse and text and ideas, Switching the, that same kind of investigative rigor to a different set of aesthetics can be something that you know anyone needs um, some more tools with. So that's been an interesting um, aspect of connectivity that I've been looking at. And I've been... That's great. That was thank you, Ryan. That was great because I think you um, you hit on a lot of the um, <clears throat> many many different tools that we use in connectivity, like. Um, lobby engagements, um, you know, pre-show emails and communications. Um, <laughs> Uh, after parties, alcohol, all of these things are actually really important in terms of, you know, getting people to sort of let their guard down and, um, and engage with the work in a different way. Um, so, so I think um, I'd like to go a little bit further and ask Jocelyn to go a little bit deeper into some of those tools. Um, but just to back up a little bit and clarify um, those, those initial goals behind connectivity from, from our point of view. Um, uh, you know, this program really started with um, a 30th anniversary conference that we did a few years ago here on um, theater, democracy, and engagement in the 21st century. Um, and that was a moment for us to sort of pause what we were doing. We had just moved into this new space, you know, right off the mall, and, um, and think about the, the significance of making new work in Washington, D.C. Um, and, and we realized that, that the next horizon for us was how to more directly insert what we were doing, the work that we were making into the civic discourse that was already happening in Washington. That was what we were really interested in. And we realized that most of the playwrights that we were really passionate about working with wanted to provoke a conversation that doesn't usually happen in Washington, um, or that doesn't usually happen in this country. And so the most exciting artistic conversations we were, happening, we were having was with those artists saying, okay, so, so who are you really making this piece for? You know, who would you be really curious to hear respond to this piece? Who would be the most exciting people from the Washington community to get in the room here? Um, and how can we make that happen? So this is really about who is in the room for us. And it became, all right, well, can we use that to increase the number of people that are in the room and the quality of the interaction that they're having when they're here? Um, so I think the first big, and we had no idea in concrete terms what that actually meant, um, but I think the first real palpable success that we had with connectivity with these experiments 
was when we did um, our original production of Clyburn Park, which Howard directed. Um, and, and we did what seemed like a really simple experiment that was a stroke of genius, I think, on the part of um, Rachel Grossman, our original connectivity director, <laughs> because the play is about neighborhoods and how neighborhoods change. Um, there was a, a very um, direct opening for people to relate the content of the play to their own experience here in this city. And so, um, so Rachel came up with a really clear question that illustrated that relevance. Is your neighborhood Clyburn Park? And that was on all of our posters. And um, while we were in, in rehearsal still for the show, she went out and found neighborhood bloggers, people from every ward in the city who are sort of like already at the center of those conversations. And she said, um, I want you to come see the show during preview week for free. And I want you to write about it on your blog. And I will give you a discount code for all of the readers of your blog to come and see the show at any time during the run. And that did unbelievable <laughs> things to our attendance because the, the, the makeup, the composition of those audiences nightly were magical. Um, and, and that was something that we just sort of stumbled on. And we've had, we sort of stumbled on other magical moments like when we did uh, Robert O'Hara's Play Booty Candy. Um, we just realized that the show was running during the Capitol Pride Festival and there was a Black Pride family picnic that went on in the city every year that we weren't even aware of but that connected very directly to the content of the show. And so we realized we need to go to the picnic and we need to just hang out with people and, and give them really tangible ways of, of being invited to the show and making it easy for them. Um, so, so at this point, we, we know what success looks like and we're trying to get a little bit more um, consistent about the tools that we deploy to, um, to achieve that kind of success. And so, um, so in a minute, I'm gonna ask Jocelyn to talk a little bit more specifically about some of those tools. Um, then I want to take um, a little bit to, um, to ask Jamil to talk about um, the goals and the basic tools behind radical hospitality um, because I think it's very related to this question of who is in your audience, specifically which neighborhoods in your city are being represented. Um, and, then, um, and then I think we probably want to open it up to questions. Um, and then I want to end, don't even have a watch, does anybody have a watch? Just want to make sure we have enough time to talk a little bit about um, a lot of experience that, that you've already been experiencing out here. When, um, when, when do you want a high sign? Um, thank you. And we have until 12? Is that right? Mm -hmm. oh, um, okay, great. So could you just give a little wave when we've got like 15 more minutes? Thank you, Pete. Um, okay, so, uh, so Jocelyn, can you talk a little bit about um, these tools like audience design, the CLAC, um, lobby experience. What does that mean when we talk about that? Sure, I'll do my best. Um, so, uh, I'll talk about the CLAC first. So, the CLAC is basically um, a group of about, we have about 18 members of the CLAC right now. Um, they're sort of highly engaged um, audience, woolly audience members um, who serve as sort of part advisory board, part focus group, part volunteer corps. Um, we have uh, about five or six um, sort of mandatory meetings that they come to every year where they actually sit and do a round table reading of the upcoming <coughs> show that we're doing. And then we sort of brainstorm with them, um, as Miriam was mentioning before, sort of who is this play for? What are some of the things that we can um, organize around this show to get people in the community excited about the show? Um, what are some special events that we can plan? Um, you know, we talk about the blog, we talk about all different ways to sort of engage with the audience, and it's a great way to get a sort of semi-outsider's <coughs> perspective on the play. Um, and then we um, ask CLAC members to serve on what we call working groups. Um, so we have a working group around each show that we do, and that working group meets four to five times before the show actually is up on our stage. And the working group is comprised of CLAC members, board members, staff members, interns, community members, um, people who might have um, a particular interest in the show. And they actually help me sort of execute the, the connectivity initiatives for the show. Um, so the CLAC, you know, they're, they're wonderful. They, they act as um, community ambassadors for the theater, um, reaching out to their networks. The CLAC, one of the things that I've been doing since I've gotten here is sort of diversifying the CLAC both in, times of, in terms of where they're employed, in terms of their ethnicity, in terms of the neighborhoods that they come from in DC. Um, so they're a really important part of making connectivity sort of work. Um, 
Uh, you know, the lobby design, I think, is a really <coughs> important element. Um, one of the things that I've been working on um, is trying to engage more with the visual art community. Um, we have an amazing space, as you can see, um, with lots of wall space. Um, so I've been thinking about ways that we can get um, visual artists to either commission them to make work particularly for us that are related to the shows or um, to find artists who are creating art that's related to themes and plays that we're producing and try to figure out a way to display that work. Um, so to try to connect the visual arts community with the performing arts community. Can I interrupt you for a second just to ask to talk specifically about Mr. Burns? Because um, this is another really great example, I think, of using a lobby experience to um, to sort of um, unlock some sort of puzzling aesthetic or stylistic aspects of a show. Um, because th this was a play written by Ann Washburn that we did called Mr. Burns, a post-electric play. Um, and one of the really, um, <laughs> the, the narrative is, is very deeply submerged, as you probably know in a lot of Ann's work, which is why we love it. Um, but there was one really important um, element of the narrative that we thought the audience might miss, which is that the time skipped forward twice in the play. So the first act happened um, very, very uh, shortly in the future. The next act happened seven years later, and the next act, act happened 75 years after that. And the play made zero sense if you didn't get that. <laughs> so, um, so Jocelyn actually mentioned yeah. Right, so we, we got this grant, um, um, and we used the grant, I think it was from the Humanities Council, um, but we wanted to try to figure out a way to help the audience understand that sort of time shift in the play. So the, the first act sort of is about, um, you know, tomorrow after the apocalypse, and the second act is seven years later after the apocalypse, and the third act is 75 years later after the apocalypse. Um, and so what we did is we commissioned three <coughs> DC artists, um, one is a painter, one was a more of a graffiti artist, and the third artist was a collage artist. And so we asked them to consider um, three basic um, sort of infrastructures um, and how the, the, they would be affected in the event of apocalypse. So we had one of them focused on electricity, um, one of them focused on um, water, and the other one focused on sort of structural engineering, like what would happen to our buildings. Um, we paired these audience, uh, these artists up with um, members from uh, that community, like Pepco, the electricity company, DC Water, a structural engineering firm, so they could get sort of the scientific um, uh, sort of context behind it. And then they created, they each created three paintings. So what would happen seven years later if we had no water? What would happen 75 years later? What would happen tomorrow if, um, you know, electricity went out? Um, and then we, in the gallery um, up on the second level of the theater, we sort of laid um, out these paintings in order so that the audience coming in could sort of take like, a, tr a time traveling kind of journey looking at kind of the deterioration or the evolution of you know what would happen after this apocalyptic event that Anne describes in her play so I thought that that was a really great way not only to involve the visual arts community with what we were doing but um, to also give context and um, give kind of an entry point to um, uh, the, the aesthetic uh, that and the structure that Anne has set up in Mr. Burns. Um. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more just about um, the notion of audience design and what we need to look at? Yeah, sure. So um, audience design is, is sort of from this impulse that just like we design costumes, we design sets, we design lightings, there's a way in which that we can design an audience for whom the show is going to have the most, we call it explosive engagement, essentially for whom the show is going to resonate with most. Um, and we think that that's important not only for these um, uh, sort of highly engaged audience members, many of them new to Wooly, who will be coming to see the work, but we also think that it provides a really, really um, powerful experience for um, our sort of regular subscriber base and our regular audiences who are gonna come to anything that, they, that we produce. Um, one of the things that um, Aaron Posner, who's one of the directors we work with a lot, says that when he came to see Booty Candy, because of all the outreach work we had done in the black gay community in DC, um, he said that the audience that he was watching the show with actually taught him how to watch the show. Um, just based on where they were laughing, where they were shocked, where they were squealing, like 
he, I think he had a very, very different experience with the show because of the people that he was surrounded by. So we think that it's really important to engage um, very specifically around um, audiences. So when we're going to do a production, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about and working with the playwright and the director about like who is this, who is this play for? Who ideally, you know, demographically, psychographically, based on interests, based on you know where they work, what their professional lives are like, like. Who, who should see this play? Who is this play um, going to resonate with most? And then I do a lot of community out, just basic community outreach, community organizing work um, around the show to um, create those, those audiences um, for the production. I mean, some of the tools that I have is, um, I have a lot of complimentary tickets, quite frankly, that I, I you know, I give away hundreds of tickets for free um, and try to focus on um, preview performances, hoping that um, getting those audiences in, in early is going to spread word of mouth around their own um, um, networks who may have similar interests. Um, do a lot of discount coding. Um, I try to work with organizations on special events. So if it's like, um, for example, for, uh, you for me for you, which have, has anyone seen that yet? Okay, so the show you know is about North Korea. We engage with the Korea Economic Institute, um, which does a lot of work around um, sort of panel discussions and policy discussions um, around North Korean issues. And so they were really interested in not only bringing a group to see the show, but they were interested in setting up a pre-show panel discussion, something that they would do anyway with their organization, and including the playwright on that panel, so that the playwright, so all the panelists read the play, and the playwright was there, and they talked about the ways in which um, the play sort of illuminated um, real-world implications of what's happening in, South, in North Korea and South Korea. Um, today and it was kind of a really um, important time for that organization because the South Korea elections had just happened, which are having strong implications on um, North Korea South Korea relationships. Um, so those are some, kind of some of the things we think about in terms of audience design. Like, who's this play for? How can we engage them and get them into the theater? And that's a great segue to ask you to be able to talk a little bit about um, those initial those initial goals behind um, radical hospitality and how that related to the question of who's in your audience. Yeah, um, so for Mixed Blood, since, since our founding, uh, it's all been about uh, breaking down artificial barriers that keep people from uh, succeeding and excelling in society. Uh, I think a couple years back, uh, our board sat down uh, with the artistic director, uh, Jack Ruler, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> it's hard when someone's like staring right at you. <laughs> <laughs> Am I doing it right? No, man. Uh, but no, uh, so uh, our boys sat down with Jack, and you know, we're really saying, so what are the barriers that we, you know, that we are still, that people are still running up against, right? And how can we, as a theater, uh, whose mission is, is to break down these barriers, what can we do? And I think uh, they came through a, a lot of data analysis and said, economics, uh, the economic barrier to going to the theater is a huge problem that people are still suffering suffering from, I think all across the country, but specifically our theater uh, in Minneapolis, especially where we reside uh, within uh, the Twin Cities community. Uh, so they got together uh, and they said, hey, you know what, what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to get rid of the ticket price. Uh, and they challenged Jack and, and the staff at Mixed Blood to make it happen and uh, make it happen for uh, in perpetuity was the, was the challenge that they, they laid down, so uh, forever. Uh, people <laughs> don't have to uh, pay for tickets. and. Um, We've run, we've run with it, uh, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of challenges, uh, and we initially had a grant uh, from the Legacy Fund and some other people uh, to help us subsidize that first year, uh, and now we're doing it on our own. Uh, so now, it's how do you? Uh, and it's interesting just to hear Jocelyn and, and, and Ronnie and Miriam talk about it. But how do we find those audience members that uh, we want to uh, come and see our show? And now that our theater is not about selling tickets anymore, but it's about presenting work uh, as a social service almost. Uh, and how do we go when we go about finding them and, and letting them know that the theater is here uh, to, for you to explore, for you to see yourself reflected back on stage, uh, to learn more about yourselves and those that live in your community. Uh, so how can we uh, do that better and, and eliminate ticket prices is one of them. And now also what we're going to, so now that they get there, uh, we're finding that a lot of people, now that tickets are free, this is the first time they've ever been to a live theatrical mm -hmm. event. 
so what do we do now? Now that's the, <laughs> now, so that's where we are now. Um, mm -hmm. What we try to do, we try to, uh, <coughs> on a smaller scale, change the way our lobby looks a little bit too. Uh, we've upped our social media presence. Uh, we have taken to Twitter uh, in a really, really interesting and fun way, uh, thanks to 2AMT and New Play TV. Uh, a lot of people uh, in that uh, Twitter sphere uh, connecting to them so that we can help get our message out there, but we can also find uh, our, uh, our audience, our, our possible audience members, and how can we go about uh, and engaging them in conversation. Jamil, you, you don't ask people to turn their phones off. <laughs> no, uh, Jack Ruler hates curtain speeches, uh, so, so we don't, we don't, uh, we don't ask. But actually, sometimes we even we ask people to tweet. You know, we we do tweet seats. We 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 uh, have the back uh, row in our theater uh, set aside and say, hey, and we let everyone know when they come to the theater. Don't look behind you. If you don't want to be distracted, don't look behind you. <laughs> <laughs> there are going to be people who are going to be on their phones uh, tweeting, live tweeting uh, the show with us. We try to make people feel at home uh, in whatever way we can do, and that's come as soon as they step into the door. Uh, our box office experience, we're trying to change the way people interact um, interact with us. It's, it's more conversational as transactional. Uh, the transaction is the free ticket, uh, and, and, but we are welcome you into the space and say, be with us, we want to learn from you, and we hope that we can share in that experience with you. Um, our post-it wall, uh, which is as simple as a sheet of, you know, sticky notebook paper uh, with uh, five post-it uh, stacks in front of it and some Sharpies say, hey, we want to know what you think about anything that you have. Uh, we only have like three bathrooms, so sometimes we get post-it walls like, shit, the bathroom line was too long, you know, like, so, but, but that's exactly what we're looking for. That's exactly uh, what we want our audiences to come in and talk to us about. We want to know how, how we can learn from them because uh, we hope that when they get into the theater that we can help help them learn something about themselves. Twitter screen is always visible in our lobby. Uh, we have found in the work that we do that everyone, all of our intended audience, won't always be able to make our show for whatever reason. Uh, whether we're talking about persons with disabilities, uh, you know, people uh, we found, uh, especially when we live stream one of our performances uh, that spoke specifically to autism and those on the autism spectrum, we found a large portion of our audience on that new play um, TV live streaming uh, commented via email or via Twitter and said, you know, we've never been able to see a show because my son or daughter uh, is affected by live performance or, or doesn't feel comfortable in a the theater. So being able to see a show that spoke to their our, our experience uh, through the internet was so, so powerful for us. So now we have to say, hey, if we're going to do anything, our postal conversations, we tweet out. Uh, that's, that's a way to integrate and connect with people. Uh, and we found that to be really, really exciting that we are finding new ways with this, this new way we're going about our work, letting people in uh, for no cost. It's changing the way that we have to think about the theater work that we do uh, in our events, um, in who we are as people, how we attack our work, uh, the supplemental uh, events that we have. Uh, those are all types of things that, we're, you know, right now we are thinking about how, how can we uh, better serve uh, our audience now that uh, the transaction isn't financial. And you all have a transportation fund as well, right? Yeah, so uh, anybody who self-identifies as a person with a disability um, can call up a uh, red and white cab uh, in the Twin Oaks box office. Uh, that's, this is why they're right there on the side. Uh, but they call up our box office and then we set it up uh, with our cab service. I don't know if it's red or white cab. Uh, but <laughs> and, and then we will arrange uh, for them to be picked up, which is really, really great too, right? Uh, if you have a mobility issue, getting to the theater uh, on a Friday or a Saturday night may not be the easiest thing in the world. So having that service that you don't have to pay for, um, to get you to and from the theater safely um, has, has, is great. Uh, and we, we see that a lot of people are taking advantage of it. Um, you know, sometimes you know that, we all know, you can give your tickets away for free and, uh, and, and have you know, tons of programming, but if no one knows about it or they can't get to it, what's the point of it? Uh, so being able to uh, not only uh, have these programs, but be able to find ways to get people to the programs that's what it's about, right? It's just about getting people 
uh, to where you are, uh, but we are now trying to find more ways to actually get us to where they are. And I think uh, you know, the work Willie is doing with connectivity is along the lines where we want to move to as well, right? Where we can um, go out and find those communities, get, get our hands on people in those communities, take our work out to them, which is some of the stuff that we do with our touring program um, as well, where we tour all through uh, upper Midwest and uh, take the work that Mixed Blood does uh, to those shows. So. Can you talk a little bit more about that too? Because I, I felt like I, I just the other day when when you were talking with Jack, I felt like oh, I understood radical hospitality so much better when I understood the financial analysis that you all had done to sort of lay the groundwork for it. Um, and that involved, as I understand it, um, taking a look at all of your revenue streams, not just ticket income, um, and figuring out you know stabilizing all of that, predicting how much revenue would actually be lost if you took away ticket costs, but also the distinction between, so you've got multiple revenue streams like touring, which you do charge for from the, the organizations that you work with, not the individuals who come see the show, right? Yep. Um, and then you've got um, uh, you've got the, the cost of marketing, the dollars that you usually put into marketing a show when you've got, um, you know, when you're looking at your return on investment in terms of tar ticket price, and that changed as well. Um, and, then, um, and then the other piece of it seemed like, um, was, you know, does 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 the actual work that you put into marketing the show when you've got no cost tickets change? Um, are you spending more money on advertising or less money on advertising um, on the personnel that you've got actually going out and telling people about the shows? Um, and also the distinction between no cost um, reservation mm -hmm. fee and pass. Could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we still have. Um the S word is a bad word, so I'll, I'll, I'll whisper it, subscription, you know, we still, people still can get passes uh, to Mixed Blood. We've had a program uh, that's run for a long time. I think if you, in, was it 76 or 78 or something like that, if you signed up for, uh, you know, season passes at a certain certain year, way back before I was born, Jack, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you signed up and, and you said that, you, you know, you'd be a... Uh, a season subscriber back then, you can still get your tickets for very, very cheap. But so people have passes, and we're looking at our passes more. Be a supporter, uh, be an investor in what it is that you that we do. You know, these are guaranteed tickets. You know what day you're coming on. But what you're really doing is that you're really paying it forward. You're paying for uh, the next person uh, to go and see the show. So people still can at the beginning of the year say, here, you know, I want to buy a season pass or an ethno uh, metro pass, which uh, we have a. Uh, agreement with a couple of the theaters in, in, in the area, in the Twin Cities, uh, said, hey, if we have someone uh, buy tickets for our show, can they also buy tickets for your show? Um, which has been a really, really great collaborative opportunity for us. So we still have those. Um, for anybody who wants to come, uh, if they're coming from Wisconsin, which is about uh, an hour away, or uh, from the uh, upper suburbs, southern suburbs, not necessarily in the Twin Cities, and they don't want to take a chance at first come, first serve tickets, we can reserve for a fee. So it's 20 bucks uh, to reserve a ticket. Uh, but that's only half of our house, right? So we don't go past half of our house. Um, and two hours before the show, it cuts off, right? So you can't call at, you know, 7 o'clock for a 7.30 show and say, hey, you know, I want to make sure that I reserve a ticket. Hey, I'm sorry. You know, so if, if by 5.30 for a 7.30 show, we've only, you know, reserved 20 tickets, well, then there are 180 tickets that we're going to give out first come first serve uh, for our show. Uh, so it's really, really interesting. I mean, as far as budgeting, you know, we still say, well, hey, we think that we're going to get, you know, 20 people, you know, a night or whatever. Uh, so there's still, you know, there are still budget implications, right? Like, we're not all <laughs> willy-nilly uh, uh, about it. Uh, but we also have, like, the on-the-job program where we are taking the work that we're doing and working with corporations. I know a lot of theaters are doing it at Actually, I think you just read in American Theater Magazine maybe in October and November issue um, that more theaters around the country are, are, are working towards that. our touring program. A lot of the places that we tour, um, whether they're small community centers, universities, or whatever, um, they are actually getting that cost subsidized as well, right? So uh, whether it's private or government um, funds, someone is taking, taking the burden of paying uh, for it. Uh, off of the shoulders uh, of the people who want to attend. So when we tour through the Upper Midwest, a lot of our shows are still free. Uh, and that has been a really, really interesting thing. But um, yeah, the, the books are 
the books seem to be fine. You know, we still we just have to change the way we're doing it. As far as marketing, I think um, we too have um, advisory councils. Uh, depending on the show, we have a couple of standing advisory councils, a disability advisory council, a Latino advisory council. Uh, we have a very very active board. Like our board is like a great board. Like I love what they do, uh, they can be a little uh, persistent is the word I'll use, uh, to make sure that we are doing what it is that we are we are intended to do. But that's what a board should do, right? Like a board should uh, hold us uh, responsible uh, for uh, living up to our mission. Um, so our board helps us out too in getting the word out and being ambassadors uh, for the type of work that we do. Uh, we have community liaisons, we uh, mixed blood, uh, resides in a heavy um, Somali immigrant in some, uh, Somali American Somali uh, neighborhood. Um, so we have a liaison group that works with that community as well. Uh, so a lot of word of mouth, but marketing is still very, very important. Again, like we said, you can give the tickets away for free, and, but if no one knows uh, that there's a show going on uh, at the specific times, uh, no one's going to come. I think we're still trying to, in this new era, as we're throwing spaghetti at the wall, find out how we can better market uh, what it is that we do. Uh, people still think of theater as the theater, you know? <laughs> um, so how can we um, break down the big T and make it a small T, but uh, still be as inviting and have high production value, which I think also people think that because we give the tickets away for free, uh, that we're doing crappy shows and, uh, you know, two-handers or anything like that, we, you know, we just closed a, uh, a multiracial production of Next to Normal, right? So, uh, it, with you know, with a, a, a five or six piece uh, live band uh, playing every night. So we don't cheapen the experience just because uh, our tickets are cheap. Uh, you know, we still believe in producing uh, high quality work, right? Like um, excellent theater uh, should be done no matter what the cost the audience has to pay, and that's what we're that's what we continue to try to do. Um, is this sort of getting at those questions of who's in your audience and how are you engaging with them? Do you all have some questions for any of these folks? I, I would yes. like to know more about your Metro Pass and how that works, and how many theaters, and if you each charge different pricing on your tickets, how it all works. Yeah, um, great question. Uh, so, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the Ethno Metro Pass is something that we devised about 12 years ago uh, to try to attract an audience for culturally specific work, not just at our theater, but around the city. So actually, it, it is a higher price ticket, but we have culturally specific programming by both culturally specific organizations and by traditionally white organizations doing culturally specific programming. But we actually go to them and ask them for uh, seats uh, on days that they would have inventory that would go unused. So the theater gets no money. The other partner theaters don't get any money for it, uh, but they get the audience, they capture those people, hopefully they keep them coming back. And we've done it for about 12 years, and I think, you know, we've, it, it's a few hundred passes a year. that allows people to go to <coughs> 10 different shows at four or five different venues in the course of the season. And they don't have to pay, or do they do they, pay? They pay us a pass amount, which is slightly more than uh, the pass we have, uh, and they're able to go to all these other places. Uh, with Sometimes they're unrestricted, and sometimes they strictly can go on a handful of dates. And how many theaters are usually involved? There's usually four others. In the <laughs> but it's changed who they are year by year based on programming. Very Yeah, Martha, thank you. Uh, specifically, what did you do for audience engagement around Oedipus, pre-show, during the show, and after? I could ask you the same thing. <laughs> <coughs> we um, didn't do much. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm asking. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, uh, well, we, I wish John Baker was here, because he was actually the dramaturg on the show. Um, uh, from what I recall, um, we, you know, we began by talking with Luis about you know, who this piece was for, what he was after. And um, and he said, you know, because for but, him, tell, tell everybody what the piece is. Just yes, so th th this is a, an adaptation that Luis Alfaro did of um, uh, Oedipus uh, called Oedipus El Rey. It was a rolling world premiere. Um, obviously, just learn. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, so magic. Um, Borderlands and Wooly all did it, um, as well as a, a bunch of other theaters um, that went to the Victory Gardens as well. Um, so we um, we 
talk with Luis about um, you know the conversation that he really wanted to tee up with the play, and he said for him, um, you know, what was interesting about Oedipus was this question of recidivism. You know, can you change your fate, or does doing something wrong um, sort of mean that inevitably your track is, you know, your path is determined? Um, and so he said um, it would it would add meaning to the experience for him um, to actually engage with. Um, uh, folks who had been incarcerated who were working on, um, you know, re-entering re society. Um, and, and there were a lot of other, um, so that was sort of the content that we wanted to explore, but there were also aesthetic things that we wanted to explore. I mean, the, um, uh, in, in the community that, that, um, that Luis was writing about, um, tattoos are very important, um, you know, they're, especially in, you know, if you've gone through prison, if you've been incarcerated, um, that, that's a way that your story sort of gets um, gets communicated on your body, and so our costume designer did a lot of work on that. There's you know, there's nudity in the show, and so the costumes really became the tattoos that were on the actors' bodies. Um, and so we did things to to try to create a combination, a mix of people in the audiences who could relate to both the form and the content of the work. Like um, there was one, uh, there was something we started doing at that point called audience exchange which is an intentionally sort of um, um, unexpected combination of two different people uh, seeing the show and then reflecting on it and sort of um, sparking a discussion with the audience. So, um, so one night we had, um, <laughs> we had I think, um, a, a professor of um, classics and a tattoo artist. We had we had a tattoo historian. Um, I mean, we, and, and we had a lot of folks, you know, who had actually been incarcerated or worked with folks um, who were um, uh, who were sort of straddling those lives. And um, and so so we intentionally created mashups of people who were responding to different levels of the show. Um, and then, but those those discussions would not go on forever. You know, we. Um, We'd have those people join um, the, Rachel, the moderator on stage, or John, um, and then they'd, they'd answer a couple, you know, really, really brief questions about how they experienced the show, and then we'd immediately open it up to the, the rest of the audience, and the rest of the audience was always really curious about knowing more about the way that those folks experienced the show in relation to their own. Um, another, another very cool thing that um, Rachel and John did during that show was that, you know, we are very conscious of how. Um, um, your your own personal experience was probably going to inform the way that you judged the characters, you know, um, who you believed was flawed, who you believed was was um, was redeemable, and so um, so one of the things we did it was kind of labor intensive, but it was very cool. We we created three different playbills for the show, not just one, um, and so there were three different um, uh, dramaturgical essays. Um, uh, tackling the show through different lenses. One was through the lens of family, um, one was through the lens of community, and one was through the lens of the individual. Um, because Luis and um, Michael Garces, the director, and the cast talked a lot about the way that, you know, if you, if you think about your lot and the choices that you make as an individual, it's very different from the choices that you make if you think about yourself as a member of, um, of a family or of a community or of a city. Um, and so there were um, interviews with um, community members who, you know, members of the clergy, um, people who, who could speak to those different perspectives. And there was actually a different cover on the playbill, depending on which version you got. And we, we made sure that when um, couples and groups came to pick up their tickets, they got different playbills. So it was clear immediately that you were having a different experience from the person sitting next to you. And that did something very cool, but it, it, because it unlocked conversations between other patrons who did the event together. So you would sit down and you would see that your playbill was different from the person two seats over. So you would have to ask them, why is yours different? What's inside yours? Um, and so that broke down a lot of barriers between these sort of you know, um, unexpected combinations of audience members as well. So that was really interesting. Uh, I saw two things say devil's advocate questions for it. It's Jocelyn and Jamil. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So, um, Jamil first. How do you, um, uh, well, I mean, I think it, like, it, in a, maybe in a great idealistic, utopic fashion, this, this idea of, like, uh, you know, uh, making theater free, how do you um, still teach this idea of, of I'm going to use the word, training people to value theater, because we still live in, in a, a, a society in which uh, money is one way that that's created. So so that was a question there. And then for Justin, how do you, um, you, you know, of course, I think 
all of us who work with, say, in a, in a producerly uh, capacity want to sort of get at certain groups, but how do you maybe uh, avoid that maybe uh, unintentional effect of saying, this is a play for you, but this other play is not for you. And, and I think about once working at a theater company where, you know, the black play comes up every year and we get the, that community in, and then you don't see them again until the next black play the next year. And that always bothered me because we want those people to be part of an ongoing conversation. So how do you, how do you find that line in terms of, um, <coughs> so there are two questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I think, Hopefully, in my response, maybe I'll answer try to try to answer both of them. But I think it's uh, value added. You know, what what do you put around the show um, that uh, heightens the value of the show? Right. First off, I think we pick plays that mean something to the people that we want <coughs> to mean something to. Right. We are intentional about representing the stories of the people who we want in our audience. So uh, we they're when they come to the theater, they're going to find value in the show. Right. You know. Um, just with Next to Normal, the show, we made sure that we tried to tell uh, with, with the text and the things that we did and the people who we spoke to in the beginning and uh, in the salons and um, free forms, uh, just like what she was talking about, we call them free forms. Um, this play is about mental health uh, and, 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 and disability and how disabling the effects of, of, of mental illness can be. Um, but we also represented um, with our multi-ethnic casting that this doesn't only affect white people that can sing, right? Like, <laughs> 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 it affects all of us, and you know, uh, and it also. But what I thought was really, really great about our production was that we actually told how it affects the family, right? Like our play really focused on how how. Diana's uh, mental illness affects her family, uh, and how, uh, and then expand from family to community, and how we as a community uh, can um, help uh, each other, those of us on either side of it, right? Um, help each other learn and cope and things like that. So we, uh, in our postal conversations, in our free forums, or in our salons, we invited. Um, Every Sunday, we invited a different group of people uh, to come in, and we let people know. So, you know, one week we may talk about uh, how do you take care of the caretaker, right? So after the show, right, we hope that the show has value. But after the show, hey, if you're a caretaker, for free, we're going to bring in a counselor. We're going to bring in people who, who they themselves are caretakers. We're going to bring in people that you can talk to, you can have a conversation with. Let the play be the icebreaker. And now let you now here's this value added experience, and you got it all for free, right? So that's what we're hoping um, that will keep people invested in the theater. That we are putting on work that they believe in and that they want to see, um, whether they know it or not. By the time they get there, and then afterwards, we're providing them the opportunity to talk about it, to talk with other people who specialize in it, um, and try to find a whole bunch of value added things. Um, <coughs> That they, that they can experience. So I hope I answered both your questions, maybe, but not. But that's why she's here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that's such an important question, and it's something that I definitely think about a lot. I mean, I think one of the things that I try to address that, uh, one of the ways I try to address that is just trying to think about individuals not in, in sort of two-dimensional ways. Like, like, you know, a black person coming to see maybe the convert by Denai Greer that's, that's coming up. Okay. So demographically, you're black, but what are you psychographically? What are your other interests? What else do you do? Um, um, I'm also a community organizer, and so I use a lot of those strategies. Um, and um, I'm right now incorporating a lot of the information I'm collecting in our database system. Um, but really, you know, doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with community members and, 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 and finding out, you know, what, what else beyond the sort of obvious connection to the show you know they're sort of interested in and not being afraid to say so like for um, you know you for me for you we're bringing in um, the Sage Young Society we did a happy hour event with them they're a group of young professionals mostly Asian American um, who uh, uh, work around um, uh, or who are hyper interested in North Korea US relations and so of course that's a great fit for this play but we're doing a holiday show it's a comedy show called the pajama men and we're doing a young professionals night so we're going back to them and asking them to come 
to that as right. well to see the pajama so not just assuming oh you're you're asian american and you work on north korea so you're only going to be interested in plays about north korea you know but thinking about okay well they're also 20s and in their 20s and 30s you know um they're young professionals so there's another way that we can engage them so um i think that that's partly it just trying to think about people as not in these sort of like monolithic ways, but thinking about their, their whole individuals with a wide range of interests and um, um, and connections and, and, and uh, ideas. Um, yeah. Please, yeah, yeah. Just on that value issue, because I think it's uh, one of the biggest things that if, if you take value as on a continuum between cost and quality, uh, and you actually maintain or improve quality and eliminate cost, you actually optimize value, you're not devalue it. And I think that was really at the core of our thinking. Was value was what we got the most pushback on and got the most discussion of, and we really feel like we increase value, not devalue it, by having quality work at no cost. Can we talk about some of the specifics here? I'm fascinated about how financially it works <laughs> in terms of percentages. Can you talk up to that? In other words, how much of your how much of your running costs were the ticket prices? And did you have a lot of different funding aside from this initial piece of funding that allowed you to do it? Now you're on your own. So talk to me about it in terms of advertising. I mean, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm glad but to be on the spot. I just I'm just curious to as to how it works. You want to be able to keep the lights on and do everything. It was, we did. We, but yeah. really, just like these touring programs that had a third party payer where the audience associates and some host sure. pays, we just extrapolated that to our main stage where we find. There is definitely a shift from unearned uh, and can, the relationship between earned and unearned income, of course, uh, significantly. Um, but you're right. At, at our organization, uh, in the year before we started this, had about 18 percent of our million and a half dollar budget came from ticket sales. Right, 18. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the main driver of the organization. Yeah. We don't proselytize that everybody should do radical hospitality, but it worked sure. for us, right. and it did change who was in the audience dramatically and shifted mm -hmm. the financial model slightly. Sure. Oh, the, interesting. But yeah, what Jack had said to me when I was talking about it was, you know, that that was what well, you remember that resident of music, that wasn't our main that wasn't our main, main source, source of income anyway. Anyway. anyway, so why not just go the whole nine yards? Sure. You know? yeah. Yeah. We I'm actually really, decided that's, that's to do I mean. it before we ever talked about how to pay for it. And, and do you find that the advertising is different because it's put into approaching people in the community? I mean the, the money you might spend on advertising or else. <coughs> I, I would say that in the two years we've done it, we definitely shifted the way we uh, found audiences. And I think that the numbers have just gotten better in terms of how the composition of the audience. But I think, Amanda, correct me, that this year, I think where we actually didn't do as well and who our core audience used to be, the traditional theater goers that go to other theaters, is where we had the drop off. Now, that's not terrible because that's probably an easier group to go back and find. But we, our demographics got better in terms of our aspirations. Uh, and the theater going loyal audiences that we had have dropped off this year over last year and the year before. So we just need to work on that again. Jack, did radical hospitality help at all in fundraising? Because well, like, yeah. I don't want this to. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, so, it's just a different shift. Yeah, so I, uh, we still see this about the same amount of uh, dollars uh, from individual gifts, but our individual donor base has tripled, all right? So we, we're seeing way more people giving smaller amounts, but still uh, giving what they can. So what that means for me, especially, um, as I'm looking to um, usher in the next class of theater makers and theater goers, right? the fact that we are having people donate and we've tripled the amount of people who can donate. So now as, as they continue to believe in our mission and we continue to uh, grow them over the years, we just tripled the amount of people that we can get money from. Right, so I, you know, if in an in an ideal world, right, our the amount of dollars that we're bringing in will grow with them, right? A, a lot of our uh, audiences now, because of radical hospitality, are under thirty, or uh, or they're under twenty five thousand dollars, right? But right. thank, hopefully, we won't stay there, right? <laughs> like, uh, hopefully that uh, you know we will continue to make more money, and you know we won't die before we get uh, before we get there, right? Uh, the post-apocalyptic world that <laughs> really keeps reminding us about won't happen yet. Right? So then we will be able to grow that base of support uh, and turn those, um, you know, oh here's just five bucks, you know here's ten bucks. We get them in the culture of giving uh, right now uh, yeah. because the tickets are free, you know five bucks becomes 
15 bucks, which then becomes 30 bucks, which becomes 100, then it comes 1,000. Well, what so. I'm thinking though is specifically like if you went after, and I'm going to use Minneapolis as an example, you go after 3M's up there. You go to 3M and you say, hey, people who don't normally go to the theater can now come if you'll support us with our radical hospitality program. But it is a difference. May I just be honest? Sure. Sure. Just on institutional giving, the shift was from giving to support programming to supporting the users of the programming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we go to something like 3M, which has a very specific East Metro uh, residency, I mean, they're, yeah. and they, so we can, we went to them and said, not only give toward the programming as we have in the past, but give us an increase so that people from you, these communities that where the employees of 3M live can come, and we got a slight increase. That's and so we've throughout gotten some new funding, which is not about making plays, but about subsidizing audiences. Yeah. Right, right. So, so if, I, uh, if I'm hearing both of you all <coughs> Sorry, right, you. Um, <laughs> it, it sounds like um, what's, what's really shifted is the story that you can tell to your individual donors, your corporate donors, mm -hmm. and your foundation and government supporters, right? That it's, it's a story that's unique. Uh, clearly, like, we're all really curious about it. We all want to see how it works um, and, and, you know, what the results are that you get. Um, and so it sounds like what you're doing is, is asking, you know, more people to support in a different way as opposed to just charging for that ticket. Yeah, I think the idea is paid for, right? Like, uh, yeah. yeah. So I think that's probably the idea that we'll work Even with. programmatically, we found last year there was not a title anybody heard of out of seven. And we did do Next to Normal this year, which had some track record. Uh, and sort of on a percentage basis, didn't do as well as those new plays we did last year. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, back on the lobby engagement issue, yeah. which I'm, I'm really fascinated with, particularly the, the idea of the paintings to solve a dramaturgical issue, which I think is just uh, mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, do you engage the artists in that process? Did the director of the show, was he part of that discussion, or the playwright, or? You know, this is actually a great, so how are we doing on time? Uh, you get uh, 20 minutes. Okay, all right, well, we'll, we'll yeah. open it up again, but um, but maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about your work with Song and, and that moment when he talked with the cast, um, and how that sort of created another thing that we started to talk about, which is um, a, a united sense of purpose, a shared sense of purpose between the generative artists and um, and the staff and the board and the um, audiences in the larger community. Um, yeah, so what we've done in the lobby is um, we've created a sort of exhibit of the work of Song Bayuk. Um, Song Bayuk is, a, is an amazing um, uh, uh, North Korean dissident artist with an amazing personal story. He was originally a propaganda artist for the North Korean regime. Um, and then he escaped North Korea um, in early 2000s um, and uh, made his way via China to South Korea. Through that journey, he lost his father and his mother and his sister. Um, he was basically trying to escape to um, look for food. He spent some time in a labor camp. Um, and now he creates um, these amazing, as you'll see, sort of these satirical um, uh, 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 paintings kind of criticizing the North Korean regime. Um, so uh, I first heard about him um, because he had a smaller exhibit here um, in DC at an art gallery called The Dunes and the Washington Post did a write up and the managing director came to me and he's like, wouldn't it be great if we ha exhibited his um, work in the lobby? And I called up his manager and we just started talking and we thought, and not only did we want to display his work, but because his personal story was so connected to what's going on on stage for you, for me, for you, why don't we try to bring him in and be sort of in resonance with us for a while? So he was actually here with us, him and his translator, because he doesn't speak any English, and his manager were here with us for a week and a half, um, doing a lot of sort of creating a shared sense of purpose around the show both internally and then also acting as sort of a surrogate for the show externally. He um, spoke, did lectures at American University, um, University of, uh, uh, of DC and other colleges around the area. Um, he took meetings with like the ambassador for human rights in North Korea. Um, he took meetings at the US uh, Institute of Peace. He did workshops with uh, the Young Playwrights Theater, um, you know, all the while talking about his personal story, but also helping us to sort of promote and get people excited about the content of You For Me For You. Um, what was really interesting in terms of how the artists were involved in this is, um, you know, before I, I did this, I checked with Mia and showed her the work and made sure that she was cool with it being associated with the show, and she was really thrilled. Um, but when Song was here in residence, it was really great because he spoke with um, our uh, uh, staff, he came to a staff meeting, 
um, which created kind of a, a, a deeper engagement among the staff of, about, about the importance of what we were doing on stage. He came to a board mem uh, meeting and, and spoke to the board about um, sort of his story and his artwork. And then he also spoke to the cast, which is really a magical moment. I think that, um, you know, I don't perceive to speak for the director, but I, I think from what Yuri ha has said about that is that the cast was having um, sort of a hard time. Um, uh, 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 they were sort of had plateaued as far as their emotional connection to the show. Um, and so we had, um, uh, during this was during previews, um, Song come and just speak about, you know, what it was like to grow up in North Korea as a propaganda artist and to be starving during a famine and to be in a labor camp and what it was like to try to escape and to fail and then to try again. And I think that um, the cast, uh, it really sort of awakened their senses to sort of the real world implications of what um, they were presenting to make it, you know, real for them. It's not just this sort of magical, <coughs> fantastical um, uh, play about North Korea, but it's actually um, something that's legitimately happening right now in our world. It's, it's like a, ser a very serious issue that's affecting, you know, lots of people around the world. Um, so I think that, um, you know, connecting the, the visual artists, not just in showing their work, our audiences, but um, thinking about a way to engage uh, the visual artists with the artists that are creating uh, work around a similar theme or similar topic. Um, I think that's an example sure. of that working really well. I hope that answers your question. It does, yeah. I, I, and I would presume that then the, art, the, the audience members have an emotional connection to the environment of the piece before the play even begins. Did you find that to be? Yeah, that's ideal. I mean, you'll see the television screens um, out there. They're not on right now, but we, we're playing in a loop, a sort of six minute documentary yeah. about Song's life. Um, we're just talking about his life and, and how he got started as an artist. Um, so people can sort of watch that when they're coming in. Um, and I think it, it piques a level of curiosity. I mean, you walk in the theater and you see this huge picture of Kim Jong-il mm -hmm. dresses Marilyn Monroe, I think people are sort of like, what, what is this? We also, you know, we also, um, you know, sort of um, uh, have publicized the art exhibit as, um, you know, it's open and it's free to the public as, as long as the building's open. Um, and our building's open every day. And so um, we've actually, we've got a sign outside, we've actually got people coming off the street, they see free museum art, and they just sort of walk in and just start wandering around, um, which I think is really, really great, um, introducing people to the space, and, and hopefully we try to get them to buy tickets to the show as well. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think Jocelyn, you mentioned this, but I'm so curious about the, um, the community bloggers that you were talking about, and also the clack Right, the clap group that you have, um, and I'm just, I'm wondering about your methods of approach, like initial approach, and how, and I think you did talk about that a little bit, but could you just expand on how that initially came, came to be, how you initially, you know, reached out, to, especially to these community bloggers, to have them, you know, talking about what it is you guys are doing? Uh, well, that was actually during um, uh, the during a season before Jocelyn was here. Um, oh. So, from from what I recall, and Pete, maybe you remember some of this too. Um, you know, this was uh, Rachel, our, our previous connectivity director, um, had lived in D.C. for a long time, so she was really familiar with the neighborhoods. Um, but she, you know, I mean, she did your basic research of just getting on the internet and figuring out, you know, where are those conversations <coughs> happening? And then it's not a mystery to just email people and figure out, you know, hey, this. You are the human being connected to this blog. Can I have coffee with you? You know, um, and just talking with them about the way that um, again, there's a there's a shared sense of purpose. There's a shared sort of value system between um, what the artists are trying to accomplish and what people out in the actual world are trying to accomplish as well. You know, so it's not much of a leap to just say, hey, I think we're after basically the same thing. Let's get together on this. Um, particularly if you have something to offer them. If you're like, here, I want to give you this experience. It's not going to cost you anything. And here's some additional stuff that you can offer you know, your constituency um, to sort of, again, add value to, um, to what you're doing anyway. But Pete, that term, black, was initially your, your idea. Well, I, I, it's just stolen from, from French opera. Uh, mm -hmm. that it, it was uh, it, it, like a very pejorative term mm -hmm. when, the, when the diva was having a contract renegotiated. Uh, uh, would go and hire people to clap enthusiastically uh, <laughs> at the performances, so so you know the rates could be talked up. But, um, and the initial clack members were recruited uh, 
by Rachel and sometimes me and sometimes other people just hanging out in the audience after show or in the lobby after shows and looking for highly animated people. <laughs> <laughs> this goes back, um, Zelda Fitchhandler told me once that when she was recruiting the initial board for Arena, all she did was look for the most expensively dressed people in the audience. <laughs> that still works. Um, but, uh, you know, we just looked for the most activated people in coming out of the house and said, you know, so did you have a good time? Why did you have it? Have you been to Woolly before? And, you know, eventually about over a three or four month period, about 12 people kind of self-identified in that way. And, and that built the core. Um, and, yeah, and, and, you know, as Jocelyn was saying, that it's it's not a fixed group, and I think it would be very bad if it became a fixed group because the, we need them to be sort of outsiders. So there's got to be addition, subtraction over time. Um, but uh, but that's how it could start. Thanks. And you are you are a quarter tilt. Oh, we uh, I'm at Actors Express now, and we've actually stolen clock and and happily use it on a regular basis, and it's a great idea. We have a wonderful group working with us. Jocelyn, I was really interested. In, you mentioned your database about how you're collecting this information and categorizing it and what you're, what tools you're using? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is actually kind of a, 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 an organization-wide uh, sort of initiative. We use um, Tessitura right. um, for, uh, but Tessitura is amazing. Like, it does so much more than sell tickets. Um, you know, you can store documents, you can attach pictures to constituents, you can search you can add attributes, you can use it for fundraising. And so traditionally in this organization, it's been mainly used by the box office and by development. And so what we're doing um, is incorporating other departments um, into Tessitura so that we can all have the same information. So we're working from the same database system. I know that literary, the department that uh, Miriam runs, has just put all of their playwrights and that information into the database as well. Um, so right now, um, I'm working on uh, basically the connectivity data historically has mostly lived in like probably hundreds of um, <laughs> Excel spreadsheets and Word documents. Um, and so uh, it's been very challenging to sort of, you know, like reaching back to people that we've already engaged with. Then I have to look through like, you know, 56 spreadsheets to, to pick out these <laughs> right. You know, so it's sort of maddening. So um, right now I'm trying to, um, you know, one by one, uh, sort of, uh, you know, put all the information that we have about people that we've worked with in the past into this database and then creating attributes for the constituents. Like, um, you know, were you a blogger? Did you receive a connectivity comp? Did you redeem a connectivity comp? Um, did you participate in a panel discussion? Did you help organize a House Lights Up event? Um, you know, did, did someone from the connectivity department have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you? And then, because it's synced with all the other data, I can also see, is that person a donor? Did that person buy tickets to the show? Is that person a board prospect? Um, so that we're sort of all, we all have the same information in the organization. I hope to be able to, once I, you know, familiarize myself more with what the database system can do, to be able to really use that as an evaluative tool to actually run, you know, sort of almost move management reports um, to see um, if someone is initially uh, gets to the show through a connectivity initiative, how do we engage them further? Are they coming back to see a show? Are they making a contribution? Are they coming to a special event? Um, are they, uh, you know, being a postcard distributor or being a, a site for a poster um, display? Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, I don't know. Great. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to talk about a, a technology. I, uh, Jason asked me to share this with you. Uh, we we talk about ways to connect with our audience in new ways, and uh, we at Actors Express have been experimenting with a, a, a new way to create lobby engagement and engagement with Playbill, and uh, it's using an app that does image recognition. And uh, so we've created an app called the Theater Plus Network. And uh, what it does is it uh, recognizes, here's a Playbill from Wolves, which is an Actors Express. Uh, and uh, this app, when downloaded, when you view the Playbill through the app, here Freddie, our artistic director, it's hard to see, but uh, uh, here we go. We look at the image. And uh, we immediately can. Uh, oh so we can engage here with lobby posters. 
We engage uh, with the playbill itself, with the advertising in the playbill, uh, and uh, we even can trigger actions such as a call the box office, uh, go to the website. So this kind of technology, does anybody here have a smartphone? <laughs> yeah, I already downloaded it. I think your, uh, my point is that your audience does too. And uh, this is a way that we can uh, take a look and, and engage the audience, connect to the audience directly on their mobile screen. And it gives us a new tool, a new tool to reach out to, uh, to the audience and to engage them both at the theater. And uh, I've had people who have said, oh, I love this. I take the playbill home and show it to my friend. And Freddie talks to me. Uh, <laughs> the different, he was showing me the different uh, like images on one page. Like if you go to Actors Express here, you'll get the whole uh, rundown of the whole season. Or if you go to like certain ads in the program, it gives right. direct links to your advertisers as well. Mm. And can I, can I ask, was it a local tech, what was it's the tech big. company that... I've created this. Yeah, <laughs> 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 dang! Woo! Uh, it's so the great. The Theater Plus Network. The Theater RE. With an RE, yes. The Theater Plus Network. Yeah. It's in the Apple <laughs> Store and, and in the, uh, uh, of course, it has to be organized through the, the server side, so I have to work with Actors Express. It's uh, also in Atlanta now, uh, uh, the Alliance Theater, all their playbills are activated, the Atlanta Symphony, the Atlanta Opera, and the Fox Theater, which is a presenting theater, uh, are all activated. So all the playbills, and the idea now is that, that one app, we're developing a, a group in the audience that go to the different areas, and they're using the app uh, at the Symphony, and at the Opera, and at the Alliance. And so we're beginning to see that uh, pool of people that are coming together to have the have that experience. And we've There's even done things where it's not about the specific show image. Like he's got one set up that's on a five dollar bill. So you can just show the five dollar bill put the five dollar bill in your camera and then you get the Actors Express stuff pop up. So you don't have to be walking around with a wolves playbill in order to get the information. This is dark. this is a great example of another super stealable idea. <laughs> <laughs> Jojo, are we at time? We've got five minutes. Okay, let's take maybe one more call. Yeah. So I have a question about the logistical implementation of all these ideas, because these are all amazing ideas. Who does it? <laughs> because, you know, for a lot of us who work at smaller companies, is it largely driven by marketing? Is it largely driven by artistic? How, how, how does it manifest? Uh, and gonna, I'll throw this to Neil in a second because I imagine Mixblood is a different case. But, um, but for us, you know, we've got, we've got a department called Connectivity. Granted, it's a one-person department. Mm -hmm. but, um, but this is actually something, a, a department that we essentially replaced our old education department with because we just had, you know, during that 30th anniversary season, we had a coming to Jesus moment and we were just like, you know what, we're not making work that's appropriate for middle schoolers, so why are they going to build it? Yeah. Um, and so we uh, we just devoted those resources to mm. engaging with adult audience members. Mm. Um, and then, like Jocelyn mentioned, I mean, you've got like armies of volunteers and staff members and board members and just people who believe in in what you're doing to support you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because I, I am a department of one. I mean, I have I have a couple interns, but you know, I try to engage the other departments in the in the theater as much as possible. And I also have. And, right, yeah. and the dramaturg, I work very closely with the dramaturg of the show. Um, you know, I have the clack, which is about 18, 20 people. I have a volunteer core of people who just sort of want to, like, do random projects but don't want the commitment of having, um, you know, the clack. Um, and you, you'd be surprised when you're, you know, sort of engaging with community members and organizations how much that collaboration can take the load off off you. Like the Korea Economic Institute panel I mentioned, like they basically organized that entire thing. Like we just sort of provided them the space and some materials to market it. Um, so I, when I collaborate with organizations, I try to create a, you know, a shared workload um, for organizing events. Um, so that helps. Um, you know, ideally in the strategic plan, which I just created for connectivity, like the department will grow and will hire, you know, a connectivity associate um, level position because um, it is a lot of work for one person. Um, but cross departmental collaboration and then collaboration with volunteers is 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 the way that it that I try to make it work. So just, how would can you I add a tiny point to that? I mean, because I think we, we you know we went through this uh, consulting process with through the EMC Innovation Grant Program in this, and I think this notion that connectivity is a separate department is really an uh, for us became, in a way, the, the big thing that I think we struggled with 
that it wasn't a subset of marketing, mm -hmm. and at the same time that it mm -hmm. wasn't just an extension of dramaturgy, mm -hmm. and that it somehow lived between those things mm -hmm. and became a kind of cross-departmental function. There was a point in our strategic planning at Woolley about four seasons ago, um, this, and this is actually when Pete was the head of our, our strategic planning uh, effort, where we basically said to ourselves, all the important in innovations for our future lay between departments, not mm -hmm. within yeah. individual mm -hmm. departments. And it was a big moment for us, and I have to just say that the challenge of addressing that has been hard. Um, and, uh, and it's really, in a way, I think connectivity is so now well digested within the organization <laughs> and so, so, I think, supported or more, more and more supported. But I think in the beginning, it was a struggle to sort of carve out the territory to say that this notion of a sort of intentional audience design um, is really not the same as getting butts in seats. It's a different goal than marketing. And sometimes within a, a revenue-driven economy, which we, we haven't gone to the radical hospitality thing yet, we're thinking about it, uh, or, we, or we do a lot of things along those lines, but within a revenue-driven sort of, uh, you know, goal, um, sometimes they're at odds with one another. And it was really important to recognize that and to sort of grapple with that. Uh, and it, I think it, it helped move us forward, but it wasn't easy. Yeah, and, and I want to make sure that we can to respond to that from the point of view of mixed blood, because I, I get the feeling that it's not siloed in the same way for mixed blood. Yeah, no, no, I, you know, because radical hospitality is ingrained in the fabric of what we do, it becomes everybody's responsibility. Everyone is charged with um, living up to that voice decree of making it last forever. Um, in the audience engagement work, again, um, is tied directly to radical hospitality, which is tied directly to everybody's job. So it becomes everyone's responsibility to make sure that um, the salons happen and uh, that the tweet seats and the you know tweeting out from. So it becomes everybody's job, which is kind of weird uh, at times. You know, like <laughs> who who's picking up the ball? But um, we we have found um, that we all like holding the ball, right? Like, uh, and maybe it's just because uh, the Vikings aren't good, so they need, a, they need somebody to do it or something. <laughs> I get the feeling we should probably wrap up. So I just want to thank Ronnie, Tino, and Jocelyn so much. For so, um, for those of you who are joining the collaborative literary.